So thanks everybody for coming. Um, welcome to Iowa City's first ever author in residence um, with Jack Gantos. And this evening Jack's going to be discuss discussing his widely varied published catalog and from picture book series with Rotten Ralph, which many of you probably know, all the way through maybe touching on Zip 6, we'll see, yeah. um, his adult novel. And um, there will be some emphasis here tonight on journaling aspect of, of the writing as well. Um, and there will be time for Q&A at the end, and I'll walk around with my little wireless mic and have you ask questions for Jack. And um, Prairie Lights is out front. If you're interested in his catalog, they're selling most of it out there. And then afterwards, Jack will be available up front to sign, probably. So help me welcome Jack Gantos. Is that a little better? Yes. There we go. I know. Now I feel very powerful. I feel twice as important. Volume counts, apparently. Um, first off, uh, just to say thank you to, to many people. Um, to uh, Deb Green, who is uh, pretty much the, the go-to person for me on this. And, oh. And, uh... <laughs> And uh, I guess my time here is over. Uh, <laughs> did you ever read that silly picture book, uh, the, the Stupids Die? Did you ever read The Stupids Die? I love The Stupids Die. And in The, in the Stupids Die, um, the lights go out. Do you remember that? The, the lights go out. And the stupid family goes, oh my god, we must have died. Because uh, the lights went out. And, and so the animals, who are always smarter than the humans, uh, the cat goes down to the basement and changes the fuse, because the fuse is blown, and the lights come back on. So the stupids go, oh my god, we must have gone to heaven. You know, so, you know, so they go, I wonder what heaven looks like. And so they live in Cleveland, so they go outside, and there's Cleveland. They go, look, heaven looks just like Cleveland. You know? So that would be um, a stupid moment. And then, uh, so we'll go back to the the thank you portion of the evening. Um, also to the public library. Um, it's really a, a lovely public library. Um, I love the location right downtown where a public library should be, right downtown. And uh, I live in Boston and uh, my rule of course is to live close to the public library and I live within walking distance, three blocks of the public library and I've lived within blocks of the public library for most of my life. And uh, so I, I just think that's fabulous. And then it's a great public library. It has tremendous space, a great children's room, terrific children's collection. It has a teen collection, a teen room, teen space. It's got a great nonfiction collection, which, of course, anyone who really writes um, not as, is not just reading fiction all the time. We're always reading nonfiction material because uh, we need to be informed you know, of other experiences besides our own. So it's a great place, and this commitment to bringing in a writer for the community, I think, is pretty great. So I'm happy to be the first one. And uh, I spoke uh, today, I spoke to the 4th, uh, 5th, and 6th graders right off the bat, and they're great. You know, 4th, 5th, and 6th graders are, like, always smarter than everybody else. And then, uh, and then I spoke to teens, and they were lovely, and now I've got you all, so I'm very pleased. I could not be happy. So because, as I said earlier, this is billed as journal writing, we should at least focus on that for a minute before I completely abandon the topic and, <laughs> and just talk about myself, which I want to do. So let's just go right to the sort of beginning, right? So th this is uh, one of my journals from when I was a kid. So um, I started writing, of course, in journals. Journals were really the first, you know, sort of entry point. They're sort of, you know, that's where you really puncture, you know, the field of, of literature is, is with a journal. And, it's, uh, and everybody gets them these days. You know, I have a, a daughter that's 12. And every birthday party she goes to, in the goodie bag, there's always some sort of journal that comes home. And she probably has, like many of us, 200 journals with one sentence in, in each of them, you know. And it's, it's not getting the journal that is the problem. 
that's never the problem. Okay? It's writing in the journal that, that is the issue. So when I was a kid, I was probably like everybody else. You know, it, it seemed to me to be more of a cool thing to have or to own. <laughs> And it was very cool because my sister had one, and she was older. I just had one of those perfect older sisters. And, you know, she was three years older than me. And, and there's just no way you can keep up with an older sister that's three years older and smart, you know. And she was better at everything, and, and she was just perfect. She had perfect friends, perfect dressing, perfect attitude, perfect table manners. The teachers always sent home those notes, you know. You know, uh, Betsy is the perfect student. She will go far. You know, I, I got the opposite note. And then, and then, you know, my parents just treated her like, you know, like the perfect child, you know. And you kind of catch on to that, you know. Like, you know, like you would ask your parents, oh, you know, who do you love more? And they go, oh, I love them all equally. Well, you know that's not true, you know. <laughs> like, you know, you're not getting a lot of face time, you know, because everybody's turned toward her, you know. So uh, she had a journal, you know, and it was just, just this simple idea, very simple, the spark of a younger brother's mind, thinking, if I read her journal, I'll be as smart as she is and as perfect as she is, because all the secrets to perfection will be in that journal. And uh, you know it's unethical, of course, to read somebody's <laughs> journal, probably criminal, but you do it anyway, because you're possessed to do so. And so. Um, so I waited, you know, and it was, it was one of those red leather journals, you know, with the year stamped in gold and, and the little brass lock, and she had the brass key. I mean, it, it, it couldn't be more gorgeous as a journal and inviting for a brother. And so um, finally she finished it. She left the house, and uh, so I went into her room. We all know where everybody keeps their journals, underwear drawer. And... Uh, <laughs> Cleared that out right away because it's my sister's. You don't really want to touch it. And so um, <laughs> got the journal. It's locked. I got a, had a pair of scissors. Just cut, you know, the lock right <laughs> off. And, <laughs> and then I read it. I read it cover to cover. And, uh, and it was remarkably boring. It was really dull. And I was, I was a little bit shocked, you know, that, that it would be so dull. And the more I thought about it, then the more annoyed I was because I was never mentioned in the journal. <laughs> and, and the journal was, was actually set up in a very repetitious way. It was, uh, it was more like, it, it's a beautiful day, I'm very happy, life is good, my friends are fine. And then page two would be, it's another beautiful day, life is good, my friends are fine, I'm very happy. And it was, and it was all actually rather dull. And, and, I, and I just couldn't figure that out. I thought that when you opened somebody's secret journal, that it would really be like stepping into, you know, in, into a, a basement crypt. You know, you would really get under and in there. You know, it, it'd be like, you know, you, you know, like you go to the Vatican and then you go down into St. <laughs> Peter's tomb, you know, and you really get at the bones down there. You know, hey, Pete, what are you doing under here? So. You know, but it was none of that. You know, I didn't get to crawl into her skin. I didn't get to feel what she felt. I didn't get to see what she thought. I didn't see any secrets. I, and again, I didn't see myself, and I didn't get any opinion of the family. And that, none, it, you know, it just seemed vacuous to me. And it was at that moment I thought, I can do better. I can do something better than my sister. I know I can do this better. So I asked my mom for a journal, and she said, no. Not surprising. And I, he said, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And finally, you know, you just wear them down, you know, which is easy to do, quite frankly. And so, um, so I got a journal, and then, uh, then it wasn't easy to fill up, you know, because it was, uh, I had a lot of bravado, but I didn't really have any skills, you know. And so um, I would open it, you know, you would open the dang thing, and it was just like, God, it was just terrifying to open it, because you open it, you stare at it, it stares at you, you stare at it, it stares at you, you stare at it, it stares at you. You have no idea how to get started with this thing. You have no, no real entry. Nobody's ever taught you what to do with it, and, and quite frankly, you just sort of doodle around in it. So I would just put it away. And my mother was constantly harping on me. You know, have you written anything in that journal, you know? <laughs> I'm sure it costs 59 cents, but, uh, you know, it's like, you know. 
And, I, you know, and she was always after me. So I was like, God, I've got to write in this dang thing somehow. So I was more of a doodling kind of kid, you know, and so uh, I would like to draw more in the journal than really write in the journal. And so when you think of journal, when you think of writing, the, you're always thinking content. The journal is supposed to be content, bless you. And it's supposed to be honest, isn't it? The journal is the one place that you can go, you know. I mean, outside of, you know, the confession booth. But it's the one, you, you, and even there you pull your punches. But, but at least in the journal, you know, it's where you can go to dump all the good stuff. You write all the, about the great stuff and all the bad stuff and all the inner stuff. It's where Jimmy Carter should have just written, I lust in my heart, and not told anybody, you know, and, you know, you know instead of saying it to Playboy, for God's sakes, you know, and, you know, it, so it, it's that place. So, at any rate, it wasn't for me. So I was drawing. So I thought, okay, I'll just keep drawing. So I started drawing more. Let's see. Nope, I'm drawing backward there. So let's go here. Content. Content. You need to have something to write about. Isn't that the, always the problem? You know, you're like, what have I done that is so significant? And, and so right away, you've got to get over the significant issue, okay? Because if you're always looking for the significant moment, you're missing everything that is happening around you. And you, if you get rid of the notion that writing is all about tracking perfection, then you've plenty to write about, right? So let's just get rid of that sense of perfection, that the eureka is going to come down, that the hand of God is going to grip your pen, you know, and, 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 you know, and write what the book of Revelations really means. And so... <laughs> This is my sixth grade neighborhood. So for me, content, what to write about, actually started from like a visual point of view. And so I started drawing maps of my house, maps of my bedroom, maps of school, maps of the neighborhood, and started putting on it where everything interesting would happen. And it was the drawing, it was the doodling that led to the content. I could see it. And it would become real to me because I could see it. Writing is so abstract. And that blank page is such a menace that having at least a little map on there was some way for me to kind of get my head into content. So I'm just going to give you a little content here, and then we're going to go into something else called structure. But let's just go with content, right? What to write about. Now, this is the low supervision family in the neighborhood. And, and I hope you're blessed to have one in your neighborhood. And maybe you are the low supervision family, in which case you have a lot to write about. I was forbidden to play here, and there were several good reasons why. But I was there nearly every day. Frankie Pagoda. Frankie Pagoda was in sixth grade with me, and we would come home every day. My mom, you know, would, would make me stay in my yard, so I'd stand in the backyard. Frankie would come home. He would put on his bathing suit. He would put a ladder on the side of his house. He would climb up that ladder. He would get up on his roof, which was sloped, and he would run screaming down his roof and dive headfirst into the swimming pool. And that's how he started his afternoon, right there. It was like splash, you know. So he would do that. And then one day, he just got a little worked up. And then, you know, remember the big wheel? Remember that one big wheel, you know, and, you know, you go down the sidewalk. <laughs> so he drags the, the big wheel up, and he gets that on the slope. Boom, <laughs> down on that. Splash, he makes it. You know, I'm like, whoa, that's good. So then he needs, you know, he just needs a little more challenge. So he gets his bicycle up on top of the roof. And this is when I started thinking, this might not be good. So he waves to me. I wave to him. He goes down the roof, right, eh, off the edge, and he misses the pool. So you know it's got the concrete edge, you know, 
patio. So the, the front tire hits the patio. He shoots clean off of the bike, right? And you know the hard tiled edge. Bam, he hits that with his forehead, flips over, splash in the water, right? So I'm standing there. I'm like, oh, that's not good. So I go over. I break the rules. I go over to the pool. He's there like a squid. He's just floating in the water. So I grab him. I drag him out. I flip him over onto the patio. And I think, oh my god, this kid's got to be dead. Because I look at him, and he has got a dent in his forehead. Like you could plant a summer garden in there. You know? And I'm, I'm like, nice knowing you, Frank. You're a good kid. Now you're dead. You know? So no, he's not dead at all. He sits up. And he goes, oh, what happened? I said, well, you know, Frankie, you missed the pool. And he goes, oh, I can do better. So I get something, fixes the handlebars, and he hauls it up a second time. And it goes down, boom, splash, he made it. And he comes up, hey, Jack, how's that? I'm like, yeah, that's really using your head there, Frank. Good job. So that's Frankie. That's how Frankie started his day. His sister Susie, somebody told her you could dye your hair blonde with Clorox which she attempted, and it came out like Don King's haircut. It just went kind of straight up, and it was green. You know those little troll dolls she used to get? And she was sort of built that way, and she'd be running around with that green head of flame, you know, hair going straight up, you know, and that was her. And then Gary, Gary was, his nickname was Scary Gary, and he was in eighth grade. He actually went to prison before I did. And um, Gary, Gary was the first person I knew who had seen a therapist, and uh, he actually had a tape recorder and with the therapist tape on it, and it would say, Gary, think about it. <laughs> Gary, you know, that kind of thing, just give him, trying to give him pause, you know, but <laughs> Gary didn't take pause very well. So, so little things, like somebody told Gary that you could put a match out, a lit match out in a bucket of gasoline, which is absolutely true, you can. Because it's not the liquid that burns, it's the fumes above it. So if you're really fast, you light the match, you get it through the fumes fast enough, and it will douse itself in, in the liquid. You know, not bad. So there's Gary on the front yard with a bucket of gasoline. And I see him and I'm like, you know, you just know this isn't going well. So. And Gary's got his tape recorder, he's, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know, he's a big thinker. So he takes the book of matches and he's thinking, well, why use one match when you can set the whole thing on fire? You know, make a torch. So he gets out of the, boom, and the thing blows, right? So flames go up, you see the smoke, and then suddenly through the smoke comes Gary. He's running around toward the pool and he's on fire. And he runs, he dives in the pool, right? he's laughing the whole time, comes out completely naked, covered with tattoos, right? Which, like, I had never even seen one except for my dad's Navy anchor. And then, and then he comes out and he's doing like a little dance out there. And my mother's like, don't you look at him, don't you look at him. And I, it's like, what is that, you know? So that's him. Mr. Pagoda did not have a job. Now this is in an era where, you know, Everybody worked, as far as my dad was concerned. And my dad, ex-Navy, you know, would watch Mr. Pagoda. Mr. Pagoda was an inventor. He invented two things. One, a shoe repair kit that was in a spray can. So I don't know how this would work, but apparently, according to him, this is how it would work. Like you're walking down the street, right? And suddenly you go, oh my god, I have a hole in my shoe. <laughs> Better get that spray can out of this kind of goopy stuff. And you spray it on, you tramp it down, you keep going, right? Like, what do you do, walk around with that in your pocket? And then, and then he invented like an oil filter that you'd never have to change in a car, you know. That didn't go anywhere. So, so my dad would stand here, literally, and, and point at him, go, and he'd say to me, there goes the bum, see the bum? The bum's doing nothing. The bum's walking across the yard. The bum, you know, this is all, all my dad was. So, and this was the epitome of it. Cuban Missile Crisis, remember that? Okay, Cuban Missile Crisis. We're 90 miles away from nuclear-tipped missiles pointing at us. What does Mr. Pagoda do? He gets on his roof and he paints an atomic bomb target on his roof, right? And he gets to the, Mr. Castro, if you're any man at all, wing one of those things over here, you know? You know, I'm like, 
The only thing that went ballistic was my dad's head, you know. <laughs> you know. Who could not love these people, you know? So, as I'm always telling children, first step as a writer, move in next door to the dysfunctional family in the neighborhood, and you have plenty to write about. Oh, I forgot to mention, Mr. Pagoda made a fortune. He invented the Pagoda pet pad. You know those little pads that are electrified? Like, like you, know, you know when you get a little wonky, finally you get a l maybe a little older, the kids have left the house, right? And you go, okay, I can finally do the living room exactly the way I want it. And you get the white mohair couch, the white rug, the white curtains, the w everything is white. It's like, it's like a little piece of heaven in there. It's perfect, right? It's perfect, but you still have the dog, right? And so you go, I gotta keep the dog out of this room. So you get that little electrified rug. You put it in front of the doorway, you plug it in. And so the dog, you know, is like, whoa, look, there's heaven. You know, and, and it tries to make a dash for heaven, but, you know, it gets zapped. You know, like, and after a while, you know, Pavlov's right. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, dang, I'm not going, heaven's bad. And so, and, but then, and he made a lot of money selling these things. And then finally, it turned sour because then toddlers were going for heaven, you know, and then, <laughs> you know, they zap, ow, oh, you know, and then finally, like, you know, grandpa made it to heaven, you know, with the pacemakers, you know, look, heaven, yes, <laughs> you made it, <laughs> you know, and all you got was a little bit of rug, so they lost all their money, and I've never seen my father happier in his entire life, you know, so that's there. It's our dumb dog, Bobo. We had three of them. Bobo number one, Bobo number two, Bobo number three. Bobo number one, asleep in the backyard. Alligator came out. That's the end of that dog. Bobo number two, standing in the middle of the road watching cars go by. Not a good uh, position. And Bobo number three, dug a deep hole in the backyard, ran around the house bragging. I dug a hole, I dug a hole deeper than any other dog in the neighborhood. Fell in the hole, broke his neck. Where did we bury the dog? In the hole he dug, right? <laughs> My dad says, you know, my dad says, there's not going to be a bubble number four. He goes, this one's so stupid, he dug his own grave, you know, so. So I threw up on a living room wall. Um, I never wanted to go to the bathroom to throw up because it's just like the ickiest room in the house to throw up in. You drop to your knees, you hug a toilet that your sister's been sitting on, and then, and you throw up there, you know, it's like, ah. You know, what's worse, the throwing up or the thought or the imagination of somebody's butt who was just there, you know? So, so I would just throw up in various parts of the house, like a cat with a hairball, you know? It's like... <laughs> so once I hit the wall, but you could never get the stain off. It was like, it was spaghetti the night before, and it was just that greasy spaghetti stain, and, and it would just smell. We painted the wall, came back through the paint. So, it's my sister's room. That's my room where I did a lot of writing. My dad ran my bike over. That dog bit me. I was uh, a hypochondriac as a kid. I still am, actually. But um, in the early days, it seemed like it really had the best of me. So, this dog bit me. And you know how dogs, you know, like these nuts, you know, they get these like pit bulls, they feed them pieces of lost children, and then they let them roam the neighborhood. And then, you know, I'm riding my bike, so it boing, boing, boing down the street, bites me on the ankle, you know, you kick them in the nose and they run off. So I'm like, hey, they're not bad. So, so it had broken the skin. And then the next day I looked down and my ankle was really swollen. And so I was like, oh God, you know. So I squeezed it, you know, and all this pus came shooting out. And I was like, oh, God, that dog gave me rabies. That's the first thing that occurred to me. And I had no idea what rabies were, but I did know that you foamed at the mouth. So I went to the bathroom, and sure enough, I had a speck of foam. You know, it probably been there for 10 years, but I'd never seen it before. And I was like, that's it. That's the beginning of rabies right there. So I'm like... I shouldn't tell my mom because some kid in my class, my sixth grade class, had been bit by a raccoon. The raccoon had run off. They had to give him the rabies treatment, which in those days was 40 shots in the stomach, if you remember, right? And the, the nurse would get on the speaker at school 
and into the classroom and go send Johnny down to the nurse's office. And like the saddest kid you'd ever seen in the world is, like stands up and he walks about this fast to the nurse's office, you know. And then in your mind, you know, you're just thinking, you know, you go in there and then you got to get on that table, that nurse's table, which everyone is thrown up on. And it's that, you know, that little plastic mattress they have on there. They never want you to fall asleep and take a comfortable nap, you know, because that thing's like a quarter inch thick plus covered with, you know, you know, vomit, you know, stains. And then, and then you would just imagine the nurse with that giant syringe, ha, ah, chong in his stomach. So I thought, I'm not telling. Middle of the night, I wake up, I am so guilt-ridden. I'm thinking, I'm going to get full-blown rabies, I'm going to bite my mother, I'm going to bite my father, I'm going to bite my sister. We're going to run out, we're going to bite the neighbors, because of me, it's going to be like rabies nation. You know, so I go to the garage, I got a rope, and I tie myself down to the bed, right? So the next morning, I wake up, I'm tied to the bed, I'm perfectly fine. So I hear my mom say, where's Jack? He's going to be late for school, and I hear my older sister go, I'll go get him. I'm like, I'm not the sister. I'm like trying to get that dang rope off. And sure enough, she comes in. She goes, what's wrong with you? you know? I'm like, oh, I thought I had rabies. You know, I'm going through the whole thing. She's like, you don't have rabies. You're insane. You know, you know. Very active child, Kenny Deal. You know those Joey Pigza books? Right here. That's one of them. Well, Frankie and Joey, you know, between the two of them, I had material forever. And Kenny, sadly, is doing life. Renters. We were lifelong renters. We never owned a house. And, you know, you would hear people say bad things about renters. You know, like renters, they, they never mow the lawn. Well, we didn't. And then renters, you know, they always, like, have, you know, chinch bugs that spread. Well, ours did. Renters, they never paint the house. We never painted a house. You know, renters, they let the place go to pot. Well, that would be us. And so... You know, that kind of, or they always have dogs that go to the bathroom in other people's yards, you know, <laughs> our specialty. And so, at any rate, you know, I got very self-conscious about this. And so I used to watch, I'd sit at the back of the canal, and I'd watch over here at those renters. And I thought, now what do we have in common? What is there a renter gene pool, you know? And so, over there, the only thing that I recall is that they had those... Um, Oh, there's tele they look like telephone poles for, for drying clothes, you know, and, and with the wires across them. And, and they would have them up there, but there would be no clothes on them. They were just the wires. And they had like this two-year-old daughter, and they would put her in this little lederhosen <laughs> outfit. And then they would put that little snap catch on the back like here. And then they would snap the other end up on that wire. And that poor child, all day, she'd be out there, like, running like this, ah, ah, and then it would run out of lead, and she'd go, whoop, boom, and she'd hit the ground and jump up and look around. And then she'd run off the other direction, whoop, boom, you know, I'm like, dang, renters, <laughs> bad lot, <laughs> you know, to be sure, awful. Frost and Hans, um, they were retired school teachers from up north, they were very grumpy. You know, people that move to Florida, and they have nothing to do. And people think nothing to do is a paradise, but it's not. Um, nothing to do makes you weird. And so um, <laughs> they would just, like, yard work. That's all they do is yard work all day long. And they didn't even have, like, a lawnmower. They just had a ruler and a pair of scissors and every <laughs> blade of grass. <laughs> clip, clip, you know. You know, and they just hated kids, you know. And they were retired school teachers, so... I mean, they had good reason to hate us, but they had, you know, keep off the grass signs, beware dogs, every kind of sign you could get they had, you know, and none of it worked. Because the more signs they put on, you know, the more apparent your behavior would be. You know, you'd jump on the grass, you'd scream at them, they'd send out the dogs like a toy poodle or a chihuahua, you know, like, oh, help, you know, <laughs> put it in your pocket. And then the M&M's, nice people, the metrics. Uh, they had seven kids, Michael Metric, Megan Metric, Marshall Metric, Michelle Metric. Then we caught on. So we called them plain and peanut, too, melt in your mouth, not in your hand. And then we lined them up one day. We had yellow M&M, orange M&M, green M&M, and then that's all we called them. So that's sixth grade. Oh, that's me, my brother Pete, my sister Betsy. So right away, you know, you're thinking of journaling, you know. You've got your life right there. It's right there. 
You know, this is not about trying to find the, the uber moment. It's, try, it's just paying attention to the moment, you know, that's just taking place right before your eyes. It's a lovely little thing right there. So the first thing I think I want you to do when you're thinking of journaling is like, is drawing. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so this is when we lived in Barbados. So, okay, so my mother's arrested for murder. I'll tell you that whole story. And then, oh, hot pepperated contest with my father, headless chicken races. Hey, you're out here in the country. Some of you must remember this. So, you know, in Barbados, you couldn't get like chicken in a grocery store. You had to buy live chickens, you know, and then you take them home and you have to cut their heads off or ring them. All of the ringing thing is just awful, I think. But, it's more like torture, but cutting it off is more like Marie Antoinette. It seems, you know, guillot Dr. Guillotine was trying to be nice about the exit. And so, um, and so at any rate, you know, you'd cut the head off of a chicken, and then it would still run around, you know. And you, the first time you see that, you just think, oh, my God, it's a possessed chicken, you know, and the blood shooting out of its neck. And then we used to get all the, you know, like cut all the heads off, and then you take the heads and slide them on your finger, and then the beak still open and close, and, and then you have headless chicken puppet theater, you know, and then... <laughs> things like that. So you've got plenty to write about, basically. You know, so, it's, so content, content becomes something that, that you ought to just relax about and just pay real close attention to your own life. And that these little maps, which I think are purposeful, will really lead you to them. Now, the, the one thing I want to also add to this is that with every map that you draw, your house, your neighborhood, your community, whatever you draw, a lot of times what happens is the, the things that you're drawing first are the physical ideas, right? You know, the chicken got its head cut off. We're not seeing any emotional response to it. It's just a physical icon. You know, the, the pistol is a physical icon. The, the wart's a physical icon, you know. So you see all of that. But what you should be thinking simultaneous to this is what's the emotional moment? What's the emotional side of that story? And the reason I say this is... <coughs> Some people, when they get ready to write a, write a story or write a book, what they are attracted to is the physical side of the story. They're sitting down with a piece of paper, and they know that if they're writing, the car ran down the street at, a, you know, at 100 miles an hour and hit a tree and blew up. They're like, yeah, that's story. You know, that's physical. That happened. That's good. Some people actually don't start stories that way. Some people start stories from an emotional point of view, that they aren't thinking of the physical action. They're thinking of the emotional stuff. And so what you need to be doing is when you're doing your maps is also maybe making a little notation under each one of those little drawings about some sort of emotional moment that came with that. Something else that, that um, I do a lot of times with students because when you're dealing with a lot of younger students, let's say let's say fifth grade, sixth grade, that kind of thing, that, that a lot of times they're all attracted to the physical stuff. They're like, yeah, plane crashed, good, two thumbs up. Pilot died, ooh, I'm sorry about that, but the plane crash was good. You know, so, so I have them draw a clock face, and I have them carry that around all day, like in their journal, that clock face, and at 12 o'clock, I want them to write their most powerful emotion. You know, I feel happy. One o'clock, I feel sad. You know, 2 o'clock, I'm puzzled. 3 o'clock, I'm victorious. 4 o'clock, I'm a loser. 5 o'clock, you know, like, like I'm giddy. You know, and then from the emotion, then I ask them, why did you feel that way? Why did you feel happy? Why did you feel sad? Why did you feel, like, puzzled? Why? And then that leads to the physical side of the story. So they actually puncture the story through the emotional side and get to the physical. This goes from the physical to the emotional. You may be one of those people that likes the emotional side first, so there's nothing wrong with it. The whole, really, when it comes to writing, any way you get words on a piece of paper is a good approach. There is nothing wrong with it. So, 
oh God. I was just getting warmed up. Now I gotta tell a whole story. Okay, I have to tell you a story. I have to tell at least one story so I can at least get to the structure side of, of writing. So, uh, shall we do the mother? I mean, mother arrested for murder is pretty good, right? I mean, you know, it doesn't get much better than that except me going to prison, but <laughs> she beat me to prison. My own mom. Doesn't that seem wrong? So we're, so we're living in Barbados, in the, the British West Indies at this time, right? And, it, and, and it's just great. It's a, it's a terrific place. And it's really safe. And, and kids are, like, worshipped down there. And, and everybody is really, really nice. And there's no crime whatsoever. And, you know, you leave your doors open at night. And your windows are open at night. And, and everything is just beautiful. And nobody has any guns. And we certainly didn't have any guns. And, and it was just pristine until something happened that changed all of that. There were two things. One, the man down the street, a man named Stumpy Hill, and that was his name, and he, he actually had a wooden leg, you know, so <laughs> called him Stumpy Hill. And we lived on a hill. And so, <laughs> so at any rate, somebody, but they didn't break into his house. They walked into his house, you know, because the door's open. So they walked in. They were taking something. He wakes up. They get into a tussle. Not bad. He gets stabbed. Not bad. But nonetheless, just that little bit of action was huge in the neighborhood. And my dad, you know, retired military. That's pretty huge, too. So, but it was the second thing that got the whole gun thing going. So, you know, we had four kids, two parents, no gun. And one of my brothers was about one year old. So every day we would come home from school and uh, the three of, three of the children would come home from school, the parents would come home from work, and my little brother and the babysitter were, of course, at the house. So we would come up and we would smell gas, kitchen gas. And you know that smell of kitchen gas. Once you smell it, you, you know it instantly because it's, you know, it's so foul. They add the smell, actually, so you know it's gas. And uh, so we thought, oh, we have a gas leak. So we called the gas company. They come up. They can't find a leak. And then uh, my dad has a construction company, so he brings out a construction crew. They check the house. They can't find a gas leak. And then it was my mom who found it. So my mom, who worked at a bank, she got sick halfway through the day one day. And, and she came home at, at lunchtime unexpectedly through the back kitchen door. So she comes in through the back kitchen door, and she enters the room, and she catches the babysitter holding my little brother, one-year-old, right, down face first over the unlit jet, uh, gas jet, and she's gassing him to sleep for his afternoon nap. And that's why we had been smelling gas all this time, that she had been gassing him every day. So my mom walks in, sees this little moment, and, you know, she screams out loud, runs across the room, snatches my little brother, chases the woman out of the house and down the street. So that night, we're all at, at the dining room table, and my mom's telling this story, and we're all listening, you know, because it's pretty intense. And then finally she says this, which we know is an expression of anger. And she said, if I had a gun, I was so angry. If I had a gun, I would have shot that man dead on the spot. Like I said, we think that's an expression, but not everybody. So the next night at the dining room table, four kids, two parents, we finish eating. We all stand up, and my dad goes, no, 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 everybody take your seat. So we all sit back down. And he reaches under his seat, and he pulls out this brown paper bag. And he leans across the table, and he goes, clunk, right on my mom's dinner plate. And uh, my mom goes, what's this? My dad goes, oh, a little gift for you. So she reaches in, and she pulls out a 25 caliber pistol, right? And she just sort of swings it across the table. And we're like, geez, Mom. And she goes, what's this for? My dad goes, well, you said if you had a gun, you would have shot that woman. Now you have the correct piece of equipment. This situation never occur again. Take care of business. So my mom looks at him and goes, you know, look around this table. We've got four nutty children. The last thing we need in this house is a handgun. And my dad looks at my mom and goes, the only reason you don't want that gun is you don't know how to shoot it. He said, I'll give you some shooting lessons. You'll feel real comfortable. She goes, sure. So that night, he takes my mom out to this abandoned horse race track, pitch black, no street lights, nothing. She takes that little pistol out there, bam, 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 and empties it, comes home. 
So I'm up. I go, hey, Mom, how was that? She goes, pretty simple. You just sort of point it out there and pull the trigger. I'm like, okay. okay. So the next day, I wake up, and I hear my mother screaming in the kitchen. So I run down the hallway, and my mother's standing in the kitchen. She's holding the newspaper, and she's just shaking like a leaf. And I look at the headlines, and it says, Man found shot dead at racetrack. So my mom goes, Oh, my God, some poor man must have been walking across the track. I didn't see him, and I shot him. And my dad's like, Nah, it wouldn't have happened that way. And my mom's like, What do you mean it wouldn't have happened that way? I'm the only idiot out there in the middle of the night firing off a handgun. Now there's a dead man where I was. I'm calling the police. So my dad looks at my mom and goes, don't call the police. The guy's already dead. What can the police do? <laughs> so my mom just tweezes out completely. She goes, you see these children? You see these children? I'm going to tell the truth. So she picks up the phone. She calls the police. In about five minutes, they pull up in front of the house, come in our house, grab my mother, who's very nice, march her down the stairs out to the street where all the neighbors are now out looking at the murderess, my mom, put her in the back seat of the squad car and gone. In about five minutes, we went from a family of four kids, two parents, and a gun, to four kids, one parent, and a gun. We're like, trade you the gun for mom, but it's a little late for that. So my dad looked, he's blanched, you know. And I look at my father, and I don't know if either A, he's thinking, I just lost my wife, or B, he's thinking, I'm going to have to raise these four children by myself. You know? So he goes off to get a solicitor, and, you know, and we're just bouncing around the house. So we don't know what to do. Everybody's really upset. And suddenly my older, wiser sister comes into my room and she goes, I figured it out. She goes, you can save mom. I said, well, you know, I'll do anything. I love my mom. She goes, pick up the phone, call the police, tell them you fired the gun. <laughs> she said, think of it. You could save the family. We'll have three kids, two parents, and we'll visit you every Sunday in the penitentiary. I said, I can't do that. And she said, why? I said, because it's not true. You know, mom said, you have to tell the truth. And she looked at me and she said, coward, won't even save your own mom. And, you know, it really hurt. But at the same time, I was just stuck, you know. I had to tell the truth. Three days later, a cop car pulls up in front of the house. Nicely, they open the back door. My mom pops out, runs up the steps, runs into the kitchen. She starts to wash the fingerprint ink off of her hands because she's really humiliated by that. So I come screaming in from the backyard, hey, mom, how come they let you go after you killed that guy? You know. <laughs> so, you know, so turns out she said she didn't kill that man, that they did a test on the bullet from her gun and the bullet found in the man. There were two different kinds of bullets, you know, and she said, you know, and so she was let go. And just by, by accident, that man, by coincidence, that man's had been shot someplace and his body had been dumped in that field, you know? That night at the dining room table, look around, four kids, two parents. I'm like, ah, a little better. Next day, four kids, two parents, no gun. Never had a handgun in our house again, you know? And then, you know, it was every night, it was like joy, 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 joy. Two weeks later, there's the article in the newspaper, you know? What was the man shot with? Owned gun. By whom? Member of his own family. And, you know, I just remember, even as a kid, you know, I was in seventh grade, I was just like, like all that, all that joy of having my family just kind of went in reverse, you know, empathizing with somebody else's tragedy. So, that's that little story. Now, so, you've got your journal, right? So you've got your little map in your journal. And you start writing that story. When you write a story like that, you have to give yourself, well, a talking to, because you need some good writing habits. 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day. That's all we're talking. We're not talking about this whole draconian notion of sitting down for four, six, eight hours a day. You will write the journal. You will write, you know. No, none of that. You're starting 10 minutes a day. You could take that story that I just told you, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Maybe it takes you two weeks to write that story, maybe a month to write that story. But then you get that first draft in there. It's a mess. You know it's a mess. I know it's a mess. It's coming crossways, right? You're starting over here. You're crabbing over here. You've got some emotional material. You've got some physical material. You've got material that's contradictory to itself. You don't even have the dialogue in there. You've got no, you know, no good adjectives in there. There's no imagery in there. But you know more or less 
So you got the bones of that story in there, and it's a great one. You just need to polish it. So then, here's what you do. The second draft, and right away, this is when you do have to become a little task-oriented. You want to start bringing structure to that writing so that the journal, the journal is not just today I drank a cup of tea and I watched the red birds out my window. No, you want more than that. You want that material from your journal then to be transformed into literature. So, let's take that story. Characters, me and my family. Setting, well, you know, you know, my house. Problem, well, the babysitter's gassing my brother. Situation, we get a gun. Action, bang, 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 bang. Crisis, mother arrested for murder. Resolution solved the problem. They did the, like a ballistics test. And then a double ending, a physical and emotional ending. And anytime you ever write anything, I don't care whether it's a picture book, short story, novel, memoir, anything, when you come down to the end, you have a double ending. You have to have, and you have to deliver the emotional and the physical. The physical will always be the easier of the two. You know, mother released, no more gun. And then the emotional ending, almost a double emotional ending at the same time. Joy having mom home, tragedy empathizing with somebody else. By the second draft, you want to start blocking out that material so that you have the big chunky pieces sort of arranged in your mind. Usually what I'm doing is I'm typing it up. By that point, I have it typed up. And then from there, then I do about 40 drafts per, per story. Now, and the way I do drafts, and the way not to scare yourself half to death with the number 40 drafts, because it just sounds awful, and it is. It's like dental work. So. <laughs> but the way you do it, the way you do it quickly, the way you do it with great focus is to choose one task at a time in a draft. People who try to solve every problem in the story by the third draft are just in for a really bad time and nobody can really do it. So what you want to do by the third draft, you read that story like it's a movie and you're looking for the physical action, right? You're seeing everything. They went in the room, they came out of the room, you know? They fired the gun, they put it in their pocket. You know, you just want to make sure that you have all the physical side, right? Then you go back, and now we'll do an emotional draft, and we'll make sure that we get, start laying in the emotions. And then you go back, you want the dialogue, right? You want to go in and make sure all the speaking parts are in there. Then you go back and you kick out all the reallys, all the varies, all the really, well, words that aren't adjectives that somehow people seem to think are adjectives. And you kick those out and then you start putting in some real adjectives and some real images. And what you do is draft upon draft, layer upon layer, you bring life to that story and you really bring it to a fine polish. That's what you're doing with your story. So the journal itself, yes, it's a great recording tool, and people are journaling, and people are scrapbooking. But if you're thinking about journals, using your journal as the jumping off point for writing literature, this is what you do. So, and that's really what a great journal does, is it captures the world you live in, the physical world, the emotional world, and then you bring these really good, solid, you know, standard foundation writing tools to that material. And then instead of always looking for that uber moment, you realize you take the regular moments and it's the structure that gives your work that great feeling, that great sense of literature. It's not just the content, it's the organization of it and the polish. Character setting problem, generally in the beginning, action crisis, generally in the middle, and then resolution, physical and emotional ending to the end. You know, and we can go through all kinds of examples of this. We can go everything from picture books, corduroy, I don't have a button, I'm looking for a button, I get a button. I don't have a pocket, I'm looking for a pocket, I get a pocket, right? You know, it's not that hard. So, <laughs> if corduroy can do it. You know, Don Freeman, who is really a terrific children's book person. Remember Earl the Squirrel? I love Earl the Squirrel. But Corduroy, Corduroy is, you know, is a big one. And, uh, and so when he died, he gave, uh, you know, those copyrights went to his family. And, and the family estate then sold them off. And so somebody else owns Corduroy. And so they've made some very ersatz Corduroy books. 
And I have to tell you, if you don't think having a pocket is, is kind of, you know, big problem, but, or, or a button is a big problem. They've got one now. Corduroy steps out of his house, and his house is in the middle of the block. And Corduroy can't find a corner. He goes a little bit this way. He can't find the corner. He goes a little bit the other way. He can't find the corner. I'm like, dang, Corduroy needs assisted living. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, you know, it's just not right. You know, <laughs> poor Corduroy. We can do a little bit better, you know, for a classic character like that. Now, back to that journaling business a little bit. Here's the thing. You can buy a really expensive journal, right? Okay. And we all know that when we want to get back into journaling, right, there's that desire to get into it. You know, and many of us have this memory. I've had three or four or five or six, seven, eight journals. I got them all started, but I never kept them up. And I really want to keep them up. So you bait yourself somehow. You, so you think, I'm going to buy a really expensive one, and it's going to cost me so much money, and I am so cheap, I will definitely write in it. You know, so, so you go out, you buy a very expensive leather-bound one, right? And then you get an, a very expensive pen, too, right? You go out, you buy a beautiful fountain pen, you know, and you're like, whoa, I paid a lot for this pen. I paid a lot for this journal. And that first night, you prop your pillows up, you get into bed, right? Get a cup of tea, and you are going to town because you're writing from stuff from 1940. You're getting caught up, you know. And then the war. It was a long war, you know. So you, you're like, Phew. That was a long war. It's two in the morning. You know, but you finally, got, you know, it was finally, you know, 1945. You pulled out of there. Next night, something comes up, but you get a few words in. Next night, something comes up. Next night, something comes up. You know, over the weekend, you might get a little bit in. And then a week goes by, and then a month goes by, and then you see this little skin of dust <laughs> sitting on that journal. And you're like, oh, that's a symbol of my failure. I must put that in a drawer so I don't see it anymore. <laughs> Because it just shouts at me, loser, 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 <laughs> shirker. And so, you know, and so you put it in the drawer along with that pen, which you bend the nib on, you know, because you're like, enough of this. <laughs> and so, and then every now and again you open a drawer, you're like, oh, God, you know. So, yeah, we all have been there, you know. So I think what you need to do, if you're going to take on the journal, is like, really, set a goal you can reach. Be nice to yourself, you know? If you think you're going to get caught up on 1940, forget it. You know, just try yesterday, you know, would be a nice start. You know, this morning. So get a decent journal. You can get a reasonable price journal. You probably don't need the lock and key anymore. Why pay extra for it? Every lock fits, every key fits every lock anyway. And then... You know, you get it, and then you know, like 10 or 15 minutes, you can do that. There are all kinds of little tricky things you can do. Like when I pick my daughter up at school, you know, I always get in that line, that carpool line. I get there 15 minutes early. What do I do? I'm pulling out my journal. I sit there, you know, I keep the windows up, you know, so none of those other folks want to talk to me because they always want to talk to you. Look, I've got a book. Will you read it? No, I'm not reading your book. I'm having trouble writing my own dang book. Can't you see? <laughs> I'm going to stab you with my pen. <laughs> you know, get out of here. And then, and then, you know, little things like that. So you can actually park in the park. You know, take it, take it with you. Sit down on the bench for 15 minutes. You can go, you know, you can be like J.K. Rowling and go to the coffee shop and watch everybody else, you know, have 200 lattes later. <laughs> you know, they're, they're writing with both hands. <laughs> Look, you know, in a language they don't even know. And so, so you don't have to be just completely wacky about it. You have to be reasonable about it. And you have to be decent to yourself about it. So get that journal. The other thing you do, get a packet of post-it notes, you know, and just keep those post-it notes in your pocket at all times, right? And so as you're going through your day, you don't have to write down the whole event. But you know how one sentence, one phrase will bring everything back to you? And if your memory is anything like mine, 
Like, I need a phrase to bring it back, you know? Like, I need a key word, you know, to remind me, because I'll get to the end of the day, and I don't even know what I've done, you know, pre-noon. So, you know, you get that post-it note out, and you slap that in your journal, and then that gives you, like, a little roadmap for your next 10 minutes of what you're going to be doing. So all day long, you're just collecting those tidbits and giving yourself a fighting chance and a head start. So it's, it's a very nice jump start. So it's just a little bit. I'll tell you this because it's just so silly. But I live in a house, it's me and my wife, I have a 12-year-old daughter and two cats, and we have four bathrooms. Everybody gets their own, <laughs> even the cats. So, so, and in my bathroom, on, on the drawers in the bathroom, one of them is a complete desk. You, know, you, put, you open that drawer, right, right next to the sink, Right? I have several journals in there. I've got books. I've got pens. I've got, you know those, you know when you go to a, a pretty decent hotel and they've got that whole stationary set and it's that, that thing you open it up and it's like, whoa, that's a lovely set. <laughs> and then the acquisitional part of you takes over and you put it in your briefcase and leave quickly, but, <laughs> but you don't take the towel. That's, you know, I never did take your towel, just your stationary. And, so I've got one of those in there because you need a hard board, right? So I got that. So I have a little office actually in the bathroom. And so I'll just go in there. People think, oh, he's going to the bathroom again. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm going in there to work. You know, and it's, it's great. You can go in there, get some work done, you know, come out 15 minutes later, you got another chapter. It's good, you know. So you set yourself up. The glove compartment of your car should have a little something in there, you know so that when you have those moments, you can take advantage of them. So it's really, really great. All of us would love to get somewhere toward the end of our lives um, and still be vital and, uh, and have journals. Have like a little shelf of journals. Wouldn't it be so nice? And you could pull them down, you could reread them, you could read the funny things your kids said that made you laugh when they were four years old, you know. And then if you were a teacher, all those great things that students did and said to you, and then, you know, as, as a person, all the things that you felt, the new things that you discovered in your life, the falling in love, you know, the, you know all of that kind, all of these great moments in life. But they wouldn't just be great moments in life. They wouldn't just be the Taj Mahal of life. They would be your Taj Mahal of life, you know? And that's what it would be. It would be your take, your people, your thoughts, your feelings, your ideas. So if that's all you end up with, that is a great accomplishment. That's an incredible accomplishment. You don't have to have published books. You'd be publishing your own book. One of the things I always do in a journal I always draw a title page on all my journals. I turn my journals into books. So I have a title page, I have an author page, I have a dedication page. I have all of that stuff. I, I treat it just like it's a book. It's just a, it's a one printing only book. <laughs> hey, the most rare, right? So that's it. Now, I write picture books. I write books of short stories. The Jack Henry books of short stories, we saw some of those covers. Um, let's see. We're going back or are we going forward? Ah, that's one of the Jack Henry books. So all of these books, all the Jack Henry books, Jack Adrift, Jack on the Tracks, Heads or Tails, Jack's New Power, Jack's Black Book, they're all books of short stories from 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th grade that I pulled out of the journals later in life, right? Rewrote them and turned them into books. If I did not keep those journals as a kid, I wouldn't have these books, you know? That'd be a real hole in my career. The Joey Pigza books, you know, are, you know, how do I know Joey Pigza? From, you know, living next door to him for years, you know? And, and then other books, like, oh, we got to go back the other way. I'm sorry. Bear with me. There's Joey. Ah. And then Desire Alliance, Hall of My Life. You know, so this is a memoir. Now, I lost this journal. This is the only real journal. Well, I lost two of them. But this is the only real one. This was when I went to prison for drug smuggling. Spent a year and a half in prison. Um, it was just a little excursion, you know. <laughs> Children's book writer. I can't be that bad. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Like I said, my mom beat me to prison, so, you know, 
out of precedent in my family. So, um, but I kept a journal in prison that was eventually confiscated, you know, but nonetheless, I, then I wrote this memoir, you know, from, from memory, which probably turned out to be better um, in retrospect in that way. And uh, so that, I don't know, it just seems like, like all these little things in life that, you know, if you keep looking for that, for the car crash of life, you know, to write about, you're going to miss it. You know, it's all that little stuff that is just so really important to write about. And your take on it is what makes it important. Finally, we have time for at least as many questions as you wish. Um, any questions about writing? My books, your books, yes. Oh, yes, pass that. No, don't, pa I don't need it. Self-consciousness, you know, like I think um, I remember trying to, write, and you think, well, does this mean I'm an egotist because I think someone might see this in the future and I'll be judged? And so, do you know what I mean? I must be in the Midwest. Jack, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to repeat the question for. Oh, the please repeat TV. that question. The person was asking about self-consciousness in journaling and how to get over that. Yes, and we weren't talking about raising consciousness or self-consciousness, we're talking about getting over it, right? So like, I don't know, because to me, you know, as a writer, it's all about me. I'm at the very center of my writing life, right? And I should be at the center of my writing life. I should know about, you know, what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling and what I'm seeing and what I'm perceiving and how I'm putting it all together. That makes me at the center. So if I'm writing and I look like I'm at the center, that should make me self-conscious. That should make me conscious that, uh, that I am at the center, that I'm getting the good stuff. So no, I'm not afraid of anything I put in a journal, you know. Not at all. Be it an unrelenting force. Yes? Um, I would like to know, if you, you, you say you don't censor yourself, your own experiences, but what if the good stuff happened to, like, your sister? What if it was your sister going to prison? Would you censor yourself talking of the stuff that your sister or your brother or your parents might not want to read about? Well, uh, the question is, what if, uh, if I don't censor my own self, what about them? If it was my sister who had gone to prison, would I, would I censor that? A lot of times, if, if some of us want to write about our families, many of us do want to write about our families, and many of us do really write about our families, you know? I mean, you know, anytime you've ever been to a shrink, the first thing they do is say, tell me about your family. That's the opening line to therapy. So, for me, I don't pull my punches. Now, my mother does not have certain books in her house that I've written. Um, the Jack Henry books, right, which are about my family, I send her a set every year. Five books go in that house, and somehow they go out. They go in, they go out. <laughs> so finally, you know, I said, hey, Mom, how come, you know, the books aren't here? I'd send them to you every year. She goes, well, honey, you know, they're about our family, and, you know, your Uncle Bill might come over, and you know what you said about your Uncle Bill. Well, I said, Mom, I said, it's funny. Uncle Bill was hit by a car when he was a kid, and it, it knocked a chunk of his, his skull off, okay? But he's fine. He's totally fine. But they did put a metal plate on his head, all right? So as a kid, I'm like, whoa, look at the metal plate. It's so cool. So I used to sneak up on him with magnets, and I used to <laughs> stick magnets on and like, and say, give me your wallet, you know? You know. And, and I thought I could control his thoughts, right? Now, to me, that's funny. To my mother, that's like, oh my God, you're making fun of Uncle Bill, you know? And, and I don't think I am. So when I write it, I can't anticipate my mother's reaction. Otherwise, I'll be paralyzed. And I won't write anything at all, you know? Because my mother used to look, used to watch the Mormon tabler, tabler, Tabernacle Choir every, you know, Christmas. And she would say, honey, the greatest thing you could ever do is be one of those boys, you know? <laughs> well, if I was, you know, I wouldn't be this guy. <laughs> Any final question? Ma'am. I want to know, I see where all your other characters come from, but who's the rotten Ralph in your family? 
The Ron Ralph in my family? Who is the Ron Ralph of my family? Some people suggest that I am Ron Ralph and that my sister is Sarah, the, the forgiving, mature one, and I am the one that is always out of control, that sort of thing. But really, I had a cat when I was a student in college. And I, was, I went to Emerson College in Boston. I got a BFA in creative writing. I should have come here for my MFA, but no, I, was, I, was, I don't know why. I just really blew that. And then, but at any rate, so I was writing picture books. I was writing failed picture books. And I wanted to write about a cat, so I got a cat. I got a used cat for the newspaper. And I got it from Harvard University. It was a Harvard dorm cat. And it was just a hellion. It was just a rascal of a cat. And I got that cat back. And it was, and so I wrote about a rotten cat. And I wrote about that cat. So that, there really is a cat that sort of created that. But it did, I would say it braided well with my personality. <laughs> <laughs> and then it lived and lived and lived and lived. <laughs> Oh my God, you know the bad ones live forever. You know, you're like, you get that nice cat, right? It loves you, it sits on your lap, it purrs. You're like, oh, I love you, dead. You know, it's like. <laughs> Finally, and one last question. Yes, Deb. Can you talk a little bit about the love curse of the Lombard? Because that really is an interesting. Do you want, you want a little love curse? No, yeah. okay, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, this is, there it is. Okay, this was a journal book. So whenever I visit my mom, my mom's a great talker, but she's an unconscious talker. She never thinks she's telling a story, she just talks, but she tells the best stories. And so I always like pay close attention when I'm with my mother. Here are the two things I do with her. Um, whenever I go to visit her, we always go to the cemetery. She doesn't drive, thank God. And, uh, and so I give her my journal as we're driving through the cemetery. And, uh, you know, she knows more people underground than above ground. So, you know, like, she shows, oh, stop. And each stone is like a map for her. Oh, this one, this one, this one, this one. I'm like, write it down. She's writing stuff down. So, and then one night she was um, cooking spaghetti. And I had my journal on my lap. And I was on the other side of the kitchen counter where she can't see me making notes on what she's saying because she'll get self-conscious and won't be as good. And so, um, She's talking about the rumbaws. And now, my mom's a rumbaw. I'm part rumbaw. And the two rumbaw twins, Abner and Adolf Rumbaw, were raised by their mother who controlled their every life. And they were identical twins. And they, they lived with their mother until she was ancient. And they were ancient too. And then when she died, they didn't know what to do, so they preserved her. So my mother said, my mother said, and then they preserved her, you know. <laughs> They were the weird ones in the family. And so I said, well, I said, wait, preserve, like pickles? She said, no, like a deer, you know, like taxiderm. You know, so, you know, once again, I'm thinking like corduroy, you know, <laughs> assisted living. And so, so as it turned out, you know, I had to, you know, I thought, well, that's really interesting, you know, so I'm writing about that, because it doesn't happen every day. You know, psycho, you know, comes around every now and again, but, so I, uh, I sort of did some research and started looking into it, you know, and, and, and why this would take place. Why would anybody love their mother so much that they were, thought they would be paralyzed without her and they needed, they needed to taxiderm her and mount her on a little piece of uh, plywood with wheels and bring her around? Why, you know, why? Why would somebody need that? Some people do, apparently, and there's a reason. And, and, and so do we have, I'll give you the reason. So the, the reason is that the mother rescued them from, a, from an, an experiment, like a medical experiment. The, the father was an American eugenicist, and he believed in, in Aryan, you know, in the, the whole Aryan powers. That be, and the, the eugenics movement believed that if you were white, you would go to the top no matter what. And, and so they needed medical proof of this, so they were, they were doing experiments on twins, you know, like Dr. Mengele, remember him? And so, so they, the father gave the twins to the eugenic society. They split the twins up, put one with a poor family, one with a rich family, and, and started tracking them. And, and they believed that you know, when they were older, they would both be very successful, no matter what their background, because they had the right gene pool, you know, Germanic. And so 
Um, so they were gone for a few years. The mother went nuts, and she finally found them, got them back, and she really mothered them. You know, she, I mean, wouldn't let them do anything. It was church and work, and that's it. You know, so when she died, they were like helpless babies all over again. So that became the trigger mechanism for them to go ahead and keep her around. But it allowed me in this book to really talk about the eugenics movement in this country, which is kind of a little dark chapter in American history, um, and one well worth looking into. Um, so at any rate, so that's what uh, that book is. But that came right from a little journal moment, right? From out of mom's mouth. <laughs> Listen to your mother. They always say that. <laughs> Finally, um, I've gone over by 10 minutes. The, uh, the, the audience on television is by now turned this off and they have moved on to another NCIS episode. And uh, <laughs> of which, what, are there 10,000 of those episodes? I mean, it's forever. I know. And, uh, and I just want to say that it's been such a pleasure to be in, in Iowa City, and of course, even a double pleasure being part of the library, since I'm such a library rat in my daily life. I spend all my time, that's where I write all my books, or in, in the library. I go to the library to write. I have an office at home I never use. I just go to the library every day. And then, um, and I, I just want to say that tomorrow I'm going to be speaking to younger children, a lot of younger children, and so I'll be working with them on picture books and how to organize and, and write picture books. So, We've worked uh, for two days, we'll be working, and we'll cover everything from journals to short stories to novels to picture books, and, uh, and it's been such a pleasure. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.